Hi guys, welcome to another exciting video from our channel. In today's video, we are going to talk about Life of Diane Hendricks. But before we get into it, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss a video from us. That said, come let's take a look. Is there any prospect of becoming a wholly red state based on these unions and a right to work state? What can we do to assist you? Diane Hendricks, America's richest self-made woman with a personal net worth of $7.8 billion, asked Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. Well, in a few weeks, we'll start with our budget adjustment bill, he said. The first step would be to deal with collective bargaining for all government workers, he added, adding that a divide and conquer technique will be used. Pro-union people around the country were outraged by this brief session, which fell short of being considered a real discourse. In a statement to Politico as he sought for a second term as governor in 2019, Walker said, I'm proud to be the pro-education governor because our policies are working. The comment borders on a joke according to Tony Evers, his opponent at the time and eventual Democratic successor. The pudding's evidence is in the eating. I'm not sure how many people think he's telling the truth. Regardless of political persuasion, no one can disagree that Hendricks has considerable authority in her own state which she has utilized for less contentious initiatives such as reviving Beloit, one of America's numerous Rust Belt communities. It's important for a country's continuous advancement to turn around the depleted economy scattered over the Midwest, which is why politicians from both parties are campaigning at the few surviving industrial plants. Diane has proved her ability to finish the duty that Washington politicians claim would be completed every four years for small-town America. As a result, in the run-up to the 2016 election, then-presidential candidate Donald Trump selected Hendricks to his economic advisory team. This appointment should be made by any candidate for public office who is serious about repositioning the Rust Belt for success. Yes, the name T was used, but this isn't about him. It's about a minimum-wage teen mom who dropped out of high school and divorced her child's father at the age of 21. She's a woman who has never lost sight of her greater goal for life despite huge obstacles, and it's her choice to choose the less traveled way that has made all the difference. Let's take a peek at Diane's early years. Diane Hendricks was born in 1947 on a dairy farm in rural Wisconsin where she grew up and had a great time growing up on the farm. She recalls her childhood home to Forbes as a beautiful house, a big square white house. However, I'd always wanted to visit a metropolis and I had planned on dressing up. Because she was one of eight girls, her father never allowed her to undertake man's jobs around the home. He recruited young men to work on the farm while the girls took care of the home. I would have wanted to be outdoors, she admits. In town, my father was well liked. People would tell me years later, Wally was always concerned about the schools and the neighborhood, they'd remark. Diane's family relocated to a new farm near Osseo, Wisconsin when she was nine years old. I became pregnant by my first love at 17 and did what my parents think was the acceptable thing. She joked, adding, I felt pregnant by my first love at 17 and did what my parents believed was the appropriate thing. I tied the knot with them. Hendricks, who completed her graduation by studying at home during her final year, recalls, you couldn't go to school and be pregnant at the time. I would go up and complete my exam and give in my papers after the other kids had left. It was embarrassing, but it was wonderful. She and her husband packed their possessions and moved to Janesville, Wisconsin, a month before her 18th birthday, where he got employment at a Chrysler factory and she worked on the Parker Pan assembly line. Working at a factory was not Diane's favorite job. She also tried waitressing, but neither profession seemed to suit her idealized vision of what life should be like. Ken and Diane bought roughly 100 properties in the Beloit area within three years of comp rating with only about 10 of them being single-family homes and the rest being two to four unit departments. We could fix up a three-bedroom home for $10,000 at the time. With Ken's father's help, we completed the bulk of the work on the homes ourselves. Diane remembers, I completed around 200 units alone. I'm the one out there getting things started, Ken previously told Inc. Magazine. Diane is a perfectionist who is meticulous in her attention to detail. Ken and Diane were married in 1975. The marriage license formalizes the connection, but this teen mom and high school dropout had already embarked on what may be described as America's most financially successful romance. Ken's indefatigable work ethic as a roofer has taken him around the nation to military sites, Kmart shops, and other locales. 
he noticed two problems wherever he went. An inefficient and wasteful industrial supply chain, and when he did locate a shop that had the goods he needed, store owners typically treated contractors like second-class individuals. Seeing hardworking, honest roofers like my father being treated like lowlifes shattered my heart. He adds, I wanted to change that image. As a consequence, he and Diane set out to devise a wholesale shop idea aimed toward contractors that would give continuous access to critical supplies, treat clients with respect, and of course, waste no resources. Remember that half-eaten sandwich she could stomach seeing thrown away? When Ken and I launched ABC, we spent two years working on four strategy and threw away a lot of paper. We had a map and decided that this is where the distribution is needed, and this is where the manufacturers are today. We performed a lot of study in our sector on a large scale. Diane continues while also disclosing their lofty goals. We started with one store, but we knew we wanted to have 200 locations. They committed everything they owned in order to get a $900,000 bank loan in 1982, which they used to buy three struggling stores. The first few locations of American Builders and Contractor Supply or ABC would sell siding, windows, doors, tools, and equipment. The business plan that the two device turned out to be spot on. However, when they established their fifth store, they ran into a snag. The bank they were working with no longer wanted to do business with them. We'd go to the next bank, tell them we were doing so well and they'd ask us to leave, Diane says. And I can say this, we always paid our bills so it wasn't because our credit was bad or because we weren't conducting our business professionally and with integrity. We just didn't fit their model. By 1986, the company had grown to 50 locations generating $183 million in revenue. Part of Diane Hendrick's success can be attributed to seizing opportunities when they arise. For example, when she and Ken were on vacation in 1984, Gaff's distribution hubs for roofing manufacturer put up for sale. They flew back to the United States, boarded an aircraft to New York, and went to look at the 13 stores that were being sold. Readers might be surprised to learn that they had no idea how they were going to buy 13 properties at the same time. Opportunity doesn't always come at the right time, Diane explains. Sometimes you just have to adjust your plans because that opportunity will not come along again. By 1994, the company had grown to 100 locations across the country, with sales reaching $1 billion four years later. As a result, in 1998, Ken and Diane hired David Luck, the former president of Bridge Firestone, to handle the day-to-day -day operations at ABC. This would provide the pair with much-needed time to concentrate and a variety of little businesses they own. ABC had 345 locations, 6,000 employees, and $3.1 billion in revenues by 2006. According to an article in Inc. Magazine from that year, around half of ABC's growth came from the acquisition of struggling independent distributors, with the remainder coming from the acquisition of successful distributors and the startup of new ones. Ken admits that scavenging unwanted enterprises has almost become a habit for him. Wrong location, says the narrator. It must be moved. Who are the wrong people? Replacing them is a good idea. Is this the wrong industry for you? I'm not convinced. I own a machine tool firm and we're doing well. I'd be happy to work in the coal industry. It's all about how you look at something and how you manage it. To many, amassing a multi-billion dollar wealth over the period of two and a half decades may appear to be an impossible job. But Diane manages to divide it down into manageable chunks. She says we knew what the contractor wanted. They needed options and they needed to be handled with dignity and respect. Despite the fact that they were driving a pickup truck, they were running a business and we recognized the effort required to be a roofing contractor. And with that, we have come to an end of our video. If you enjoyed it, do like, share, subscribe to our channel for more such exciting content. See you in the next video.